Good morning. I'm Janet Rossand. I'm President and Scientific Director of the Gardner Foundation. And I have the pleasure of moderating today's panel on COVID-19, The Road Forward. This is the first of the Gardner Foundation's online global perspective panels. Since 1959, the Gardner Foundation has awarded its prestigious Canada Gardner Awards to some of the world's top scientists whose fundamental science discoveries have really changed our understanding and treatment of serious health problems worldwide. And in the current global pandemic, we're proud that many of our laureates are actively involved in many different aspects of COVID-related research. Today, we're going to explore the science of coronavirus infections, the urgent search for new drug therapies and vaccines, and how to model the time course of pandemic outbreaks and the social and economic impact on vulnerable populations worldwide. I want to acknowledge the gener generous sponsorship of this panel by Genome Canada, a longtime friend and partner of the Gardner Foundation. On April the 24th, the Government of Canada announced funding through Genome Canada for the Canadian COVID-19 Genomic Network, CanGoGen. This coordinated national whole genome sequencing initiative will provide essential information for tracking and managing COVID-19, as well as informing our understanding of the variable clinical response of patients to the disease. We hope to feature updates on this and other major Canadian COVID research initiatives in our next online panel. Now let me briefly introduce the members of the panel. I'll have more to say about them in turn as we go through. Lauren Tyrell is going to talk to us about coronavirus infections and the search for antiviral therapies, Lauren. Rina Rapioli on developing co coronavirus vaccines, a worldwide effort. Good morning, Rina. Good afternoon in Italy. Christopher Murray, who's going to talk to us about modeling corona out coronavirus outbreaks. And Karisha and Salim Abdul Karim on implementing community interventions in South Africa. Each speaker is going to give a short talk, and then we'll have a Q&A session addressed to all the speakers. Those of you who are watching online, you can submit a question through the chat function to any of the speakers or a general question. We'll try to pick up some of those questions during the Q&A, but obviously we will have time limitations, so we'll see how well we can do. So first up is Lorne Tyrell. Lorne is the founding director of the Lee Ka-shing Institute of Virology at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. He's, uh, he was also the chair emeritus of the Gardner Foundation Board of Directors for many years. For four decades, he's been a leading figure in Canadian health research and in understanding and addressing viral disease, in particular, hepatitis B and C. Today, he's going to talk to us about coronavirus. Lorne. Janet, it's my pleasure to uh, speak to you today on coronavirus infections and uh, the search for antiviral therapies. Can I have next slide, please? Human coronaviruses have been around, first identified, I think, in 1967 as part of the common cold viruses, and there were four coronaviruses that have been identified as circulating in the population uh, causing uh, mild or relatively mild respiratory infections. However, in the last two decades, we have seen the emergence of very severe coronavirus infections. SARS in 2002, that resulted in uh, about 8,000 patients infected and about uh, 800 deaths, or almost 800 deaths, uh, with a death rate of about 10%. Uh, MERS, uh, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome with a death rate of 34%. And finally, SARS coronavirus 2, COVID-19, our epidemic today. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Whenever there's a new virus like this, we undertake public health measures initially. And the first approach uh, to this was able to control the SARS and the MERS epidemics and is struggling now to uh, deal with the COVID-19. Antivirals are critical to modified disease outcomes. 
sometimes there's no vaccine and antivirals alone have been the drugs that have controlled the diseases. The best examples are HIV AIDS and hepatitis C virus, where antivirals alone have managed these diseases. Of course, what we all are waiting for is a vaccine, a vaccine that will prevent this disease, and clearly prevention is the ultimate goal. Next slide, please. So as we look for new antiviral agents, there are really, we looked at repurposing drugs that are already licensed. The advantage of this is that it is fast. The disadvantages, they may not be as highly effective as we would like. The second way is to discover new antivirals. The advantage being that they may be more, more effective for this specific virus. The disadvantage is it takes slower and to get them through regulation to the patients. Next slide, please. The COVID virus is a rather large 30 kilobase positive strand RNA genome, and it produces a number of proteins. And the proteins that we'll focus on today are the replicase, which is the replication of the virus, and the main protease of the virus. But there are other major sites that could be targets for antiviral therapy. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk about remdesivir, which is a RNA uh, dependent RNA polymerase inhibitor. This drug was developed initially to inhibit Ebola virus by Gilead Sciences. It was tested in Ebola and did not really work as well as we hoped in that trial. Uh, but it does have broad spectrum antiviral activity uh, for the coronaviruses and the mechanism of action has been demonstrated to be rather unique in two very nice papers in journal Biological Chemis Chemistry by my colleague Matthias Gote. There is a similarity between the natural substrate, ATP, and <coughs> remdesivir triphosphate. You can see the structures here. Next slide, please. There was a paper very early in the epidemic showing that remdesivir was very effective at inhibiting the virus at low concentrations, around one micromolar, IC50. You will also see on this slide chloroquine, which we'll talk briefly about. But these two were identified as two drugs that could be repurposed for the treatment of COVID-19. Next slide, please. I will just show you briefly these results showing that remdesivir when it is, does not inhibit the entry of the virus, as you can see here, but it does inhibit the virus after it enters the cell. Chloroquine has an ability to inhibit primarily the entry of the virus, but once the virus is in and replicating the cell, it's not as effective. These were early results in the COVID uh, search. Next slide, please. I simply want to show the mechanism of remdesivir. Down at the bottom here is where remdesivir is in, incorporated into the uh, growing strand of, DNA, of RNA, and it goes three nucleotides beyond and then stops the replication at incorporation plus three nucleotide. Next slide, please. This just simply shows you a schematic of how um, Remdesivir inhibits, here is the template RNA and the primer RNA. Wherever there's a uridine, it gets incorporated as remdesivir. And one of the unique things about remdesivir triphosphate is it is actually uh, preferentially incorporated over the natural substrate ATP. And then three more nucleotides are added and the, the, the RNA chain is terminated. And it's a highly unique property the selective incorporation of remdesivir triphosphate into the growing chain. This is work from Matthias Gote at the University of Alberta. Next slide. Remdesivir has gone into clinical trials, and I want to say that the first trial that was done in China did not show benefit of remdesivir. This was a patients were an average of 12.5 days into their disease when it was added, and it simply did not show that much benefit. However, there is an adaptive COVID-19 treatment uh, trial at the NIH, 
And there has been some data, preliminary data released from this trial that shows that remdesivir is having a, a, a beneficial effect. Patients recovered 31% faster in 11 days versus 15 days on placebo. And the death rate did not meet significance, but it was down from uh, a near 12% in these patients to 8%. And so there is a benefit, uh, certainly in the recovery was significantly shorter, uh, and the death rate was nearly significant. I think the trials will be released soon, and we'll see the final results of these trials. However, based on this, there is emergency drug release for remdesivir in a number of countries, and Gilead has uh, authorized a number of countries to synthesize remdesivir, uh, as well as Gilead is making a lot of it. Next slide, please. The advantages of remdesivir is it prefers, it's preferred over the natural substrate and the mechanism, another very nice paper just came out showing again that the resistance to remdesivir is going to be low. It resists the proofreading that is normally present in the virus because of this unique mechanism. And that means resistance will not be easy to develop to remdesivir. The disadvantage is that there's an IV administration and supply issues, at least temporarily, will be an issue as we're already seeing. Next slide, please. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine have received probably the most attention as potential anti antivirals working against COVID. However, the clinical trials coming out have shown, next slide, please. <laughs> that in prospective studies, the one done by the U.S. Uh, Veterans Administration Medical Centers <clears throat> released showed that chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin uh, did not have any advantage over the standard of care treatment. And there was an increased mortality rate in patients on the hydroxychloroquine alone. And uh, these findings highlight the importance of awaiting results from ongoing prospective randomized control studies before there is wide uh, spread adoption of these drugs. And I think that uh, we have seen the number of cases where chloroquine has been used and concern with the cardiac side effects and with the efficacy in treating the disease. Next slide, please. Another major target is the <clears throat> protease inhibitors, and particularly the main protease of for SARS-CoV-2. Next slide, please. <clears throat> there has been randomized controlled trials with lopinavir, ritonavir, which is a protease inhibitor, was used in HIV AIDS very successfully. Conclusion of these studies have been, there's really no observed benefit for lopinavir, ritonavir uh, beyond the treatment standard, at least when it's used alone. There are studies ongoing with beta interferon and lopinavir that may be different. Next slide, please. A very promising candidate for a protease inhibitor has been used in veterinary medicine uh, to treat a disease caused by coronavirus, a fatal fe feline infectious peritonitis, which is often fatal in cats and can be significantly improved in, with the treatment of this with these protease inhibitors. Uh, the most promising candidate is GC376, and there have been four papers in the last month emphasizing the importance of seeing this protease inhibitor move into clinical trials. And I would say today, uh, this is uh, there is an approach to the uh, FDA about a phase one trial that will start with uh, GC376. Uh, Next slide, please. We have uh, been working with this particular protease and isolated and purified it, made crystals, looked at the structure and co-crystallization next uh, with the protease inhibitor. Next slide, please. We've also seen that this is very effective against the COVID virus with an IC50 that is uh, uh, for the 376 is under uh, <clears throat> one micromolar and it is a very effective inhibitor without causing cell toxicity. Next slide, please. So it will be going into trials, but there are approximately 
60 compounds currently in clinical trials in over uh, 100 or two, uh, clinical trials. I just want to say that in hepatitis C, non-A, non-B was described in 2000, I mean, 1974, the virus discovered in 1989, and effective antivirals really in 2013, 14, decades from discovery to the antiviral therapy. In HIV AIDS, the disease described in 1980, the virus in 1983, the first antiviral in 1986 went down to years. SARS, next slide. SARS discovered in January. The sequence was released within two weeks, so everyone could work on it very quickly. And I hope in May of this year, we'll see the first successful antivirals. It has gone from decades to years to months, and the whole world is working hard on SARS to bring antiviral therapy. Let me say that these studies are showing the value of double-blind controlled trials. I would also say that the stage of disease is very important. In this case, we're dealing with an acute disease, and early treatment may alter the course of this disease much more than seeing the challenge of late disease is a huge channel, challenge for antivirals. Let me simply say that in some cases, if you use the antivirals late, they show no benefit. If you use them early, they have tremendous benefit. The best example would be shingles and zoster. COVID-19, will there be a second wave and long-term circulation? We do need antivirals to address this aspect. Next slide, please. We would hope the ultimate goal is an oral antiviral, highly effective with few side effects. I think this would be able to be used in short term, five to 10 days, not lifelong therapy as we see in some diseases. And what you're really aiming to do is change the course of this disease. Next slide, please. Sorry, there may not be a next slide, that's fine. I just want to say that the tremendous international cooperation between scientists and institutions is illustrated by a recent publication in Nature by David Gordon and 125 authors illustrating the collaboration from 30 institutions and they examined the protein-protein interaction of 29 of 26 of the 29 proteins of COVID. And they demonstrated 300, <coughs> excuse me, 332 protein-protein interactions, and 66 are druggable targets. And 29 of FDA-approved drugs could have some interaction in those sites. This illustrates the type of scientific collaboration around the world, the tremendous possibility we have of finding drugs on a more rapid basis, and I believe that this ultimate goal is achievable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lauren. I think that's a really good start. It's giving us a good understanding of the virus, how it works, and indeed how some of the candidate antivirals work as well. I'm now going to turn to Rena Raparoli, who is the Chief Scientist and Head of External R&D at GSK Vaccines in Siena, Italy. He's the 2017 Canada Gardner International Award Laureate for his work on reverse vaccinology, a genomic approach to vaccine discovery. And Dr. Raparoli is a leader in vaccine innovation and implementation worldwide. Rena. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you and good morning. Um, today I'm gonna to talk about vaccines. I'll also mention uh, slightly human monoclonal antibodies because very likely this will be uh, among the first drugs specific for uh, COVID-19 that will be uh, available. Uh, next slide is an introduction to vaccines. Uh, this is actually a work that we did back in 2002 when SARS uh, came. At that time, to make a vaccine, basically uh, you had to take the virus that you see in the left, uh, in the electromyograph in the left of the uh, slide and uh, as a schema in the right. At that time, you had to, to make a vaccine, you had to take the virus, isolate, have access to the virus that also at that time was in China, uh, uh, difficult to get access to. You had to grow it uh, in first in the lab, then in big fermenters. Then you had to inactivate 
uh, the, the virus to make sure that it was killed. And uh, then you purify it and finally you can make a vaccine and inject it. That was a long process, uh, had to grow a dangerous virus and took at least a year or two just to get to the, uh, to the first vaccine in the lab. Um, that things changed completely in the next slide, uh, back in 2013. In 2013, on the Easter day, basically, the Chinese at that time also put on, uh, they um, described the potentially pandemic influenza virus, S7 and 9, and they put the uh, sequence on the internet. Uh, on that day, basically, uh, on, East, uh, on Monday of Easter, basically, us and Craig Venter uh, used, downloaded the sequence from the internet, made a, a synthetic gene, and in a week, we had a synthetic uh, RNA vaccine ready to go into animal models. That was the first time that basically uh, we could actually do uh, a vaccine without having seen the virus, without, without access to the virus, but just by using the information downloaded from the, from the internet. Next slide shows schematically what the big change. Uh, basically, instead of shipping viruses across the world, we're basically shipping information through the internet. And you basically uh, teleport the sequence of, if, of the uh, genome of the virus and basically in somewhere else, in a different place in the world, you download information, you make a synthetic gene, and you now can make a vaccine. Uh, next slide is still a different way of showing the same thing, just showing that you uh, ship the information of the sequence across the world, and then, and then you can make a synthetic vaccine. Now, this was a pioneering work back in 2013. Uh, Today is basically technology available to every academic lab or any uh, uh, industrial lab. The consequence of that, that when on January 7, the Chinese uh, CDC put the information about the sequence of the genome of the uh, COVID-19 in the next day, basically every lab in the world was enabled to make a synthetic gene and to start to make a vaccine. Next slide shows what uh, the economist uh, basically says, that uh, immediately we had a lot of laboratories worldwide uh, working on making vaccines. Today there are more than 170 vaccines described in, in research, and just because it's become easy to make this part of the, the thing. Which are the vaccines which have been done? The next slide is still taken from uh, an article in The Economist, which describes the three main vaccines. And here I have labeled them one, two, and three. Uh, number one are nucleic acid vaccines, mostly RNA vaccines. These ones are exactly what I described for 2013. You download the sequence for the virus, you make a synthetic gene, and you inject it. So in a, in a week you can have it in the lab, in two months you, have it, you can have it in the clinic. In fact, Moderna, the biotechnology company in Boston, basically they were able to put this vaccine, uh, an RNA-based vaccine, into the clinic in 63 days from the beginning of the work. Uh, then the number two are uh, vector-based vaccines. In this case, you take the synthetic gene, you splice into a viral vector, and then you inject the viral vector. This takes a little bit longer, two, three weeks, to make the first vaccine, but then you can go into the clinic. Uh, there are several of these vaccines being developed. The most famous right now is the one uh, which is all over the news from the Oxford group in the United Kingdom, uh, which is in clinical trials as well. Uh, the third one, is a more classical vaccine. It's basically made by purified uh, spike proteins from the virus. Uh, this takes a, take a little bit longer to make because you take the synthetic gene, you put it into a mammalian cell, usually CHO, and then you express the protein, you purify the protein, 
And then you finally, once you have the pure protein, you in, use it alone or in combination with an adjuvant. An adjuvant is also mandatory, uh, almost mandatory at this point. And, and then you can make it. Um, so the good, um, the properties of these three vaccines are shown in, in the next slide. There's a text uh, that I will not go through it. I will just summarize what I say. Basically, RNA vaccines are, uh, as I said, the most rapid to make, very quickly you can do it. Uh, the only question we have about RNA vaccines is that there is no licensed RNA vaccine today. Uh, I'm, this is a wonderful technology. I'm pretty sure in 10 years will be uh, a, the, one of the most important technologies to make vaccines. But today is very early. There have been few uh, clinical trials, never been manufactured in a very large scale, never been used for safety in very large scale. So very promising, uh, the, the fastest one, but it's going to take a while to uh, I mean, there is there are the risk of uh, going through uh, vaccine licensure for the first time. The second one, the viral vectors, are a little bit more mature. Uh, there is one vaccine which is licensed, actually originally coming from Canada, and that's the Ebola vaccine. <clears throat> there are many of these vectors, and many companies are working on, on that. Uh, I still not industrially mature. There is not really huge capacity to manufacture these vaccines worldwide, uh, but uh, reasonably safe and already one vaccine license. The third one, uh, traditional protein-based vaccines are the ones that take longer to get to the clinic. They will get to the clinic by the end of the summer, I believe. Uh, however, these are the vaccines for which we have a huge experience. And the industry has a, a lot of capacity, it can manufacture in hundreds of millions of doses. Safety has been established for many vaccines like hepatitis B, papillomavirus, uh, and basically uh, we have a lot of experience and they are mature. Uh, so I believe if we're gonna need uh, hundreds of millions of doses or billions of doses, uh, these will be the vaccines that will make it uh, in such a number, uh, large number of doses. Uh, they uh, will be the last ones to arrive, but uh, the vaccines have been accelerated, so they're expected to come from middle 2021. And finally, let me uh, mention a little bit human monoclonal antibodies, number four here, and because uh, today you can make uh, human monoclonal antibodies by basically isolating memory B cells from convalescent people. And these ones can be developed very quickly because we have confidence on the human monoclonal antibodies. There have been more than 50 products have been licensed already. So we are confident about the safety, the efficacy. In the case of Ebola, they were the first drug, still the only drug for Ebola. So I trust the antibodies will also be a, a very important immune uh, tool for the immunotherapy for prevention and therapy of, uh, of things, of, of COVID-19. Next slide, uh, reports uh, an article in the New, New, York, New, York, New York Times two days ago, basically uh, releasing the very promising data on Moderna with the RNA vaccine. So we're already getting some hints that some of the vaccines uh, are working or maybe working in humans already. It's incredible. I mean, a few months ago in January, we had no idea about these vaccines. We already have data from humans. Very promising. Uh, so um, it's likely we're going to have some good vaccines. Next slide shows the reality. What I told you about today is uh, so far is basically uh, what it takes to make a vaccine. Uh, here, what I described so far is basically 10% of making vaccines. Uh, 10% uh, of the entire work that is required to make a vaccine is the work you do to have a, a, a vaccine in the lab. Success rate here is 80%. Uh, then you need to go to clinical trials. Here from basically of the under, I expect only 20% of the under 70 projects will get to clinical trials. We already have a four or five, maybe we get 15, 20. Then, the rest of the 70% is what remains 
next, which is basically big investment, um, big manufacturing, scale up, clinical trials, licensure. And then I expect that only 5%, and I hope it will be 5%, maybe less, uh, will get to the, uh, to the finish line. Um, so how many we are going to get there? Uh, probably five, maximum 10 vaccines will get to the finish line of the under 70, which are uh, initiated now. Uh, I hope they're all going to be su successful because we're going to need probably, if you want to control this uh, pandemic, we will need really hundreds and hundreds of millions and maybe billions of doses. Um, timing to get there, uh, I'll say maybe we may have some million doses by the end of this year, some of the pioneering vaccines, maybe maybe the viral vectors, maybe the, maybe the RNA, but the big volumes will come uh, middle next year uh, and by the end of next year. Finally, the last slide I think is <clears throat> going, the next one is uh, a recommendation. We need a global coordination. Uh, SETI, Gavi, WHO are trying to make a global coordination, uh, but uh, and I hope they're going to be successful because there are also uh, uh, other initiatives where a lot of nation nationalism, basically people want the vaccines for their countries, not for the globe, and they forget that uh, if we really want to conquer uh, this virus and uh, basically uh, control the pandemic, uh, cannot control in a country. We need to control globally. Uh, we have seen like, announced a few days ago the World Speed, the US Play initiative. Uh, and <clears throat> so these are the main activities that are going on worldwide. And I hope that it's going to be global coordination and we'll be able to control this, uh, uh, this pandemic. I do believe vaccines are possible uh, and they will be uh, successful. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rina. That's, that's uh, very informative. And I'm, already there are questions coming in, obviously, on the vaccine uh, level, and we'll talk some more. Our next speaker is Christopher Murray, who is Director of the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation and Professor of Global Health at the University of Washington in Seattle. And along with longtime collaborator Alan Lopez, he received the 2018 John Dirks Canada Gairdner Global Health Award for conceptualizing and quantifying the global burden of disease. And this is really a part of his very extensive career in understanding and interpreting the data of health outcomes worldwide. So welcome, uh, Chris. Thank you, Janet. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I come from the Institute for Health Metrics, and sorry, we're jumping around, no, thanks. Uh, and just to give context, uh, because uh, it'll be useful when we dive into the modeling, our routine work uh, at the Institute is focused on trying to quantify health outcomes around the world, map them at the local level, forecast much longer term than the forecast I'm going to be talking about for COVID. So we routinely forecast 20, 25 years into the future, general health outcomes, and even fertility and population out to the end of the century. And then we also do work on tracking where health resources go and health systems. Next slide. So uh, it was perhaps uh, natural that our own hospital system here at the University of Washington came to us in early March. Washington had one of the earlier epidemics in the US <clears throat> and asked us to develop a hospital utilization model for uh, planning the surge of cases that was feared in the state of Washington. Uh, we made them a model. And then other hospital systems, particularly academic hospital systems, reached out to us within the US to make a model for their own planning. And rather than do this on a piece by case by case basis, uh, we put out on uh, March, I think the 24th, our state specific forecasts. And that led to uh, many requests from countries around the world and hospital systems for similar surge forecasting. Uh, 
And then uh, somewhat to our surprise uh, in the, the White House, and there's a picture there of the task force in the White House, uh, used uh, quite extensively and have continued to use extensively these forecasts. Uh, and it's, so it's been an interesting effort at IHME. We've now moved about 20% uh, of the people that work at IHME over to this task of trying to model for countries and subnational units in different countries, uh, what might be the course of the epidemic. Initially with this focus on hospital use, and now we've been pulled into discussions about various alternative strategies, including, for example, the question about prioritization of who would receive a vaccine when it's available. Next slide. So to set the context for thinking about uh, how to model the pandemic, I think it's most, uh, the starting point is to recognize that the very blunt instrument of mandating by local or national government social distancing, that is business closures, school closures, stay at home orders, actually works and works rather well as long as you keep them in place. So here's an example of Lombardia in Italy. On the left panel is the trajectory of reported cases going up and then the long slow decline after the peak. The middle panel is the same for deaths. And then on the far right is the mobility data as measured by app use on cell phones. So one of the sort of interesting innovations on the modeling front is the widespread availability of data from uh, the uh, use of apps on phones. Uh, and many of the, the big tech companies are now making this data available. This is an example for Lombardia. And the vertical lines are the introduction of social mandates. And then a little bit later is the removal of social mandates. And you see that mobility as measured by cell phone use was very much dropped profoundly uh, and times rather well to the reduction in transmission. Roughly speaking, there's about 18 days, it varies probably from 16 to 22, between uh, infection and death. And uh, you can see rather nicely that the timing of the peak is pretty much exactly 18 days after the abrupt drop in mobility in a place like Lombardia. Next slide. So we built a model. We've actually built many models as the epidemic continues to unfold. Uh, and we built a model first around that notion that there is a rather, there's a period of time from the introduction of abrupt interruption of transmission through social distancing to the time you get to the peak. And so there's this very sort of tense period for, you know, two and a half to three and a half weeks from the introduction of those measures until you actually see some evidence of those measures working because of the lag between infection and uh, either observed cases or observed uh, deaths. What we now have in order to both handle uh, modeling the surge use in hospitals, but also modeling uh, so that we can understand the effect of taking off these social distancing measures, is we have a hybrid statistical and transmission dynamics model, or the so-called SEIR model, where SEIR stands for susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered. Uh, and the model that we have it both ingests data on a daily basis, deaths and cases and hospitalizations, uh, and then projects out transmission uh, into the future as a function of the variables that so far we've identified that predict transmission. And that is mobility, which I was showing you before, testing, because of the important role of testing, both in identifying symptomatic cases, as well as testing and contact tracing and isolation as a strategy, temperature, and the big question of seasonality, and then population density. And we try to update this model now about three times a week. Uh, initially, we were doing it daily, but the comp as we expand to more and more countries, we just haven't been able to do daily updates for all locations. Next slide. So our model, this, this hybrid statistical and transmission dynamics model, uh, we have, as I mentioned, these four drivers, 
And what we do is we go back and we, the mathematicians in our institute have developed a computationally extraordinarily fast algorithm that allows us to fit, uh, you know, on the order of 200,000 of these transmission dynamics models in about 15 minutes. Why so many? Because we want to capture all the different sources of uncertainty and translate that into a transmission dynamics model. As you've probably read in the media, uh, one of the key metrics in these transmission dynamics models is the so-called effective R. It's the number of new infections caused by an infectious case at each day. And those factors are, are correlated, because uh, of course this isn't really causal analysis. They are correlated with the temperature testing, population density, mobility. And we estimate these relationships based on national results as well as state level results in the US, Brazil, Mexico, Italy, Spain, Canada, and province also in, in Canada uh, over the, the, the data we've observed since uh, you know, the beginning of March. And then we forecast those drivers into the future as a function of what governments will do on terms of social mandates. Uh, as well as what governments will do in terms of ramping up testing, and of course, what the weather will do in terms of increasing temperature. Next slide. Now, the mobility part, which is probably the dominant driver, uh, is extremely interesting. Uh, mobility, as measured by cell phones, is a proxy for uh, trans, you know, the risk of transmission between individuals. It's not a perfect measure at all because uh, mobility at the beginning of the epidemic was probably a very good marker for how many people you were coming into contact with. But as we come into this later stage of the pandemic, people are much more cautious in their interactions. They're wearing masks. Uh, they're avoiding people in the supermarket. They're avoiding people uh, when they are out uh, and it, at coming, you know, potentially closer to others. So we have to be careful at this point, and we're starting to be a bit worried about mobility as a marker of transmission. But it's interesting on this map, this shows forecasted mobility in the U.S. as an example, and, and I'll show you some global numbers in a moment, uh, by state. And what we see here is that the places with the large epidemics in the northeast of the U.S., mobility still remains the most reduced. And there are other places where mobility is, you know, only minimally less than it was pre-pandemic. Uh, the dark, uh, red, the redder colors, which is about 10 percentage points lower than where they started at baseline in February. Next slide. So here's mobility uh, where we have studied it so far. The challenge on mobility uh, data from cell phone use is in the low and middle income countries, uh, there is a substantial bias towards the better off in those that have a smartphone, first of all, and those who turn on geopositioning services uh, you know, on their smartphone. So you have to interpret, for example, the huge reductions in mobility in South Asia uh, with that potential bias towards the better off in mind. Although on the ground from our extensive collaboration from the GBD collaboration as an example, does suggest in South Asia that there's been marked reduction in mobility even amongst uh, lower socioeconomic status groups. So quite varied reductions in mobility from smaller effects in the US, really large effects in the large epidemic sites in Europe, and large effects in some parts of uh, Latin America and South Asia. Next slide. So we take all the information, we stick that into the, the modeling framework. Uh, here are results for the US and we run those models forward. So far, we've been running these models forward only till August. Uh, we started off, remember, with this view of helping hospitals plan for the peak. And so the main concern we originally had was predicting the peak. We are now well past the peak in the United States, even though that, as you can see, the tail of that decline is very long and slow. Uh, and we foresee, you know, in the next uh, period of time, you know, two and a half months, uh, 
a total of 143,000 deaths in the U.S. with pretty large uncertainty ranges on that total. Uh, although it's been interesting in the public uh, communications how little interest there is in ranges and both government and the public seem largely interested only in the mean effect. And that's part of the, the challenge, I think, in communicating this. We produce uh, both the, the number of infections that we think that occur, and that's on the right-hand panel, the, the number of confirmed cases, which of course is a very small subset of infections. And then testing is the other line that's shooting up on the, on the diagram on the top right. And the bottom is the hospital usage estimates, as well as ICU and ventilator usage estimates. Next slide. Here's for the U.S. Uh, by state, and it just points out how even in the models, uh, how different the magnitude of the epidemic is likely to be across states. And while we uh, can model this out and put in the factors that uh, we, we can uh, try to account for, there are many aspects of why some states and countries have much smaller epidemics than others that remain a little bit of a mystery. We can't really explain all of this variation with the currently known or understood factors. Next slide. Here's for Canada. We model these uh, provinces that have large epidemics like Ontario and Quebec. Uh, some of the provinces have such small numbers that, you know, effectively there's so far minimal transmission. Uh, and here's our aggregate of the, of the provinces that we're able to model uh, because of action in Canada earlier than in the places in the U.S. with large epidemics like in the Northeast. Uh, we don't foresee numbers anywhere near even adjusting for population commensurate with what we've seen in, in bad states in the United States. Next slide. Well, where are we going next in this work? Uh, we are expanding our uh, projections to Sub-Saharan Africa, to India, as, as well as other countries in South Asia. And I think within the next few weeks, we plan to have estimate uh, forecast models for all low and middle income countries. There are some uh, big challenges in doing this. Uh, we can rather easily run models, but because we can't uh, explain why, for example, to date we have seen very small epidemics in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, and we can't explain why we're seeing such large epidemics in parts of Latin America, we remain rather concerned about how to make uh, projections for low and middle income countries. But the, the, the need to plan is there. And so we will try with all the caveats and all the uncertainty uh, to, to fill that need. The other thing that we are actively pursuing, which hopefully will not be too much longer, is translating our modeling framework down to the county level in the U.S., why is that useful? Well, both it helps planners at that level, but it also allows us to more directly capture these micro epidemics that happen in meatpacking plants or in prisons or in uh, nursing or elder care facilities. And we can more explicitly handle those and recognize that those often have their own dynamic that may be different than general community transmission. And then the other thing that we will be doing, with the caveat that uncertainty will be very large, is we will be extending our forecast to the end of the year, uh, in a large part because there's a tremendous interest and demand for planning for schools and universities in the fall, as well, of, co of course, sort of planning for the other medical resources that might be needed. And as, as vaccines and drugs come online, uh, having that longer range forecast will help understand both how to prioritize and what might be the demand uh, for those products. Next slide. So there are, uh, as I've mentioned along the way, there's a disconcerting number of puzzles out there. The puzzles that are perhaps the, the ones that uh, are the, you know, the hardest to uh, fathom right now are the rising epidemics in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, and Peru. You can see numbers there for Rio de Janeiro uh, on the right of deaths and cases. 
And the reason these are puzzling is that these are countries that have had a full set of social distancing mandates, albeit Brazil state by state, uh, in place for seven weeks. And yet they are seeing uh, exponential increases in transmission. And, you know, the, the cell phone mobility data suggests they've had huge reductions in mobility. And so this is really quite challenging for us to understand. Is it simply that there are some groups in urban slums, for example, that are not able to social distance and that's where the transmission is occurring? So we're trying with collaborators in these countries to dig into the details and understand why these are places where the mandates that worked in Europe, in Asia, and the United States and Canada so far don't seem to be working in all places. On the reverse side, in Pakistan and India, where people thought that lockdowns would not be that uh, effective, we've seen minimal cases. Mumbai is an exception and deaths. And so uh, either the lockdowns were much more effective in those low resource settings than anybody had given credit, credit for, or as some scientists in those countries think, there may be other factors that may be playing into innate immunity or uh, various theories out there about the microbiome. There's, there's a lot of hypotheses, not a lot of data yet to help understand this divergence. And then likewise in Sub-Saharan Africa, we're not seeing much in the way of transmission. So that could be that lockdowns have been much more effective in those low resource settings than anybody gave credit for, uh, or there are uh, it, other factors at, at play. So yeah, the modeling is an interesting challenge because there's so much that we don't understand. And yet we do need to try with large uncertain intervals to do the best job that we can to help guide a whole series of immediate resource allocation decisions that governments and, and uh, funders uh, have to make. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. And now I'm going to turn to Croatia and Salim Abdul Karim. They're the founding leaders of the Center for the AIDS Program of Research in South Africa, CAPRISA. They're professors also at Columbia University in the US and pro vice chancellors at the Uni University of KwaZulu Natal in Durban, South Africa. They are the 2020, this year's John Dirks Canada Gairdner Global Health Awardees for their discovery that antiretrovirals prevent sexual transmission of HIV, laying the foundations for pre exposure prophylaxis, the PrEP approach, and really contributing to the reduction of HIV infection and transmission in Africa and around the world. And today they'll talk to us about their experience now with COVID. Thank you. Sound. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you very much, Anne. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you all this uh, afternoon. Um, between Croatia and I, we are going to share with you some of our experiences in dealing with the coronavirus epidemic here in South Africa. In particular, we'll talk about some of the community interventions that we have initiated. Next slide. So when we look at the situation in South Africa, our first case was on the 5th of March. It was in a, a gentleman who had just returned from Italy and that set the whole uh, psyche in South Africa on a different footing. Until then, it was a problem somewhere else. From the first time, from the first case, it suddenly became real. We had very quick action. Within a matter of about 10, 12 days, the president declared a state of disaster. Under that, he was able to initiate certain interventions, including uh, stopping international travel, closing the borders, closing schools, and so on. And about two weeks later, he initiated a national lockdown. It is a very strict lockdown, including things like banning alcohol sales. And over the period of the lockdown, we've had a steady increase in uh, testing, and we have seen the way in which the epidemic has grown, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And over the last few weeks, the government has now started uh, easing the lockdown in a staged manner and 
at this point, we remain still under quite a strict lockdown, uh, but it's now at level four, and the cases are now starting to rise in one of the jurisdictions of South Africa. Next slide. So if we look at the, the period during which we first started seeing the cases, it was quite striking that the doubling of the number of cases in the initial period for the first three weeks and a bit was two days. Every two days, the epidemic, we have more than twice the number of cases. Since the institution of the lockdown, we've had a total of uh, several thousand cases, about 5,000, and the doubling time during that period was about 15 days. And then since the easing, the, the doubling is now coming down, it's running at about 11, 12 days. And this is just one indicator, recognizing that doubling time has its challenges and that it is influenced by the number of tests that are undertaken. Next slide. So as we look at the, uh, the response, the primary goal of the South African COVID-19 response is to flatten the curve. And it's really on the basis that without natural immunity, that everyone in South Africa is at risk and that the way in which we wanted to approach this was to ensure that we were able to introduce interventions that would reduce the peak and postpone the peak for as long as possible. Next slide. And to do that, we've instituted what is referred to here as the Coronavirus Prevention Toolbox, which introduces a range of interventions, including the usual that everyone is familiar with in social distancing, hand sanitizing, and so on. Next slide. I'll now hand over to Rachel. Thanks, Lim. Thanks, Janet. Uh, greetings, everyone. It's a real honor and privilege to be here. Thanks to SLIM for setting the scene in terms of the epidemic trajectory in South Africa and also uh, highlighting what the available public health tools we have to respond to the epidemic. So we have a number of things even as we wait for a vaccine and we don't make everything or bring everything to bear depending on where we are in the epidemic. Uh, but we are very strategic in terms of what combinations of interventions are most appropriate. So Slim has also highlighted um, the stage one and two of the epidemic in South Africa and where we are now in terms of responses is what I will highlight and focus on, which is on stages uh, three, four, and five. We have the next slide, please. So we've had the introduction of the virus uh, with travelers. We've seen the spread of the virus to contacts, particularly healthcare workers. And what we started to see uh, at the time the lockdown was initiated was community spread. But we had no idea where and how the virus was spreading at a community level. And so the government made a very bold decision to initiate community screening. And the big question is, where do you screen? And they had very clear criteria uh, in terms of selecting uh, those uh, communities where there was a high population density, low socioeconomic status, and a particular type of housing and, and a few other criteria, and identified uh, just over 900 uh, communities uh, to initiate the community testing. So what does community uh, screening involve? It's really about going house to house. So that required first engagement with the local communities, including organizations, their leadership. And what really helped us to um, very rapidly move to community testing was the fact that we had a very strong HIV and TB infrastructure where community health workers were already going house to house to identify individuals with HIV or contact tracing for TB. And within days, we were able to mobilize about 30,000 healthcare workers. And these healthcare workers were able to go and uh, using an app on a mobile device, were able, using a no-touch uh, set of screening questions, identify individuals uh, who had a particular set of symptoms, one of six symptoms, and, and depending on the combination of symptoms, 
you're able to trigger, okay, you need to have a, um, a, a COVID-19 test. And uh, this was either done in the community through local, uh, through mobile clinics, or they were referred to primary healthcare facilities. And over a period of about a month, uh, approximately um, uh, just over 10,000 house, 10 million households were visited. And at that point, there was something like 50,000 community health workers across the country doing these door-to-door -door type surveys. Next slide, please. Once cases were identified, um, the, uh, in each, uh, these individuals were assisted in isolation, either encouraged to do self-isolation or assisted isolation if self-isolation was not uh, possible. And uh, very because we were in a state of lockdown, uh, the contact tracing was quite contained to household members or close neighborhood contacts. And uh, again, as uh, positive individuals were identified, they were also put either into quarantine as they awaited test results or uh, self-isolation once test results came through and they were confirmed positive. So what we are able to do is in uh, real time, monitor how the screening coverage was happening and also where the cases were in terms of geospatial distribution and also we're looking at those geospatial maps we were able to identify hotspots in other words areas where the density of cases being identified were quite high and so this now becomes important information as we move to the next stage of the epidemic in terms of instituting levels of um, social distancing and severity of those. And one you know, extreme form of social distancing is the lockdown or staying at home uh, intervention. But as we understand better that the, there's a diversity of epidemics within the country, with some areas having much higher numbers of infections. Uh, we're able to also better plan the health services and look at what levels of surge capacity we need to have. Right now, we're looking at a lot of our cases are either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, and the admission rates remain low. And I think Chris alluded to some of this very puzzling um, state we have, uh, but I think it's a combination of very early responses. And I think that in many countries, they've been, um, the admissions to hospital is what triggered public health interventions. In South Africa, we acted at a very, very early stage of the epidemic when we identified very early transmissions from international travel. And then this mapping at a community level has enabled us to move forward. May I have the next slide, please? Um, Testing is really important, and, and here what we see is the total number of tests being done. And the testing in South Africa is done by private lab, academic institutions, and also in the public sector. If you look at the yellow bar, it's really the testing in the public sector. And you can see how from the very early days for the first, sec uh, first uh, two waves of transmission uh, to now where we're seeing community spread, uh, the substantial number of testing capacity. So that, well, this is the number of tests that are being conducted on a daily basis by the public sector labs. It's like an exponential increase that has been able to take an, a very impressive scaling up of testing capabilities within the public sector. May I have the next slide, please? And then here, uh, just highlighting that you know, if we just monitored what was coming to health facilities in the yellow bar and then looking at the orange or peach bar, you see the number of cases identified in the community and where we are initially, we were seeing those hospital admissions and then now we've reached a stage where we are identifying almost as many cases through the community screening outreach hotspot investigation as we are seeing people coming to health facilities. I'm going to hand over to Slim. Thank you. So I think as you look at this particular program and you look at the way in which we decided very early on that we were not simply going to wait for the patients to arrive in the hospitals to identify them, 
and that we were going to go out into the community and try and find as many cases as we could. And so we saw this rapid scaling up of the community program and identification of the number of tests in the community. But that program has come to an end because we needed to shift now to the next stage of our epidemic, and that is uh, of our response to the epidemic, and that's hotspots. Now we are in a situation where we are now identifying hotspots that have occurred. And to start with, they're largely occurring in one province that's in the Western Cape, in the region of Cape Town. And what's striking about it is that most of these outbreaks, these little outbreaks that are occurring, are occurring amongst uh, workers and the workplaces that were open during the lockdown. And they are principally supermarkets and grocery stores. And there, we're now better understanding the challenges that we had in that individuals, clients, uh, customers who were coming to the supermarkets were then contaminating the environment, especially the metal surfaces, and the staff were picking it up and they were transmitting it amongst themselves and then recontaminating the surface and impacting on the community. So that now in the Western Cape, we have general community transmission in addition to many of these mini outbreaks. And in all of these, we are seeing some super spreaders that have played quite a marked role in boosting the, the transmission rates that we are seeing in the Western Cape. So South Africa at the moment has pretty much two separate epidemics. We have a rapidly growing epidemic in the Western Cape and an epidemic that has remained at a pretty low level of community transmission in the rest of the country. But we think that we will see uh, uh, what we're seeing in Cape Town is just a forerunner of what's to come in the rest of the country. And so we are bracing ourselves and preparing for the rapid expansion of medical care. To the extent, for example, in Cape Town, the International Convention Center has been completely converted into a field hospital, partitions and, and beds and so on. So that's the level of preparation that was uh, possible under the lockdown. Next slide, please. So if you look at the lockdown itself, what was interesting about it, and I've just used this as a way of comparison. So I've taken the United Kingdom and I've taken South Africa. The UK is the uh, yellow dots and the yellow line and South Africa is the blue. If you look at the two lines since we've had the 100th case and you follow the trajectory, we pretty much had similar numbers of cases for the first two to three weeks or so. At about the point at which we introduced the lockdown, just around then, it's not directly related to the lockdown, but around then, the South African line changes. And you can see in the way in which we uh, were able to flatten the curve, or at least start flattening the curve. Now, you know, it's always a challenge to sort of figure out how much, is, how much of this can be attributed to the interventions, because you don't have a a, 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 a counterfactual. And in this particular instance, because the UK population is similar size to the South African population, although these countries are very different, I'm just using it for illustrative purposes that South Africa could have gone the way of having the UK line, but instead, because of the very early interventions, we happen to have the blue line. And in that period, what has been central is we've done four things. The first is we've rapidly scaled up testing and the capacity to do that testing. We scaled up our prevention program through the community screening, and we could do that because we had all of the people ready uh, and had been trained and were already doing work on TB and HIV. They were redirected to work on COVID. We were able to start preparing the healthcare service, uh, doing the training, uh, the, the, boosting the uh, availability of PPE for the nurses and the doctors. And then we built the field hospitals. And so all of these parts of the activities that we now feel like we're in a better place and better prepared to deal with the, the coming burden of the surge that we are expecting. Next slide. And I'll just end off with just pointing to the effective reproduction number. I mean, there are challenges to interpreting this because it is dependent on the number of tests. But it is striking when you look at the initial period that we had a reproduction number in close between somewhere between two and three. It's pretty high 
uh, confidence intervals because of the numbers being small at that point in the epidemic. But with the institution of the state of disaster and stopping the travel, the schools and so on, that comes down quite rapidly to below one. But then it starts picking up again and about the time in which we instituted the lockdown. And so since then we've had a reproduction number that's sort of just hovering over one. So as it stands, we anticipate that the epidemic will continue to grow because of the effective reproduction number being somewhere in the region of one, between one and two, in the, somewhere in the middle between those two. And as we think about the next steps, our goal in the hotspot part of our response is to try to continually contain the rapid spread of the virus so that as the cases occur, we will be able to have the required amount of uh, ICU beds, respirators, um, uh, ventilators, and all of the medical care requirements that we will need to try and maintain a low death rate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank all speakers for the very informative session. Now I'd like to get everybody on screen uh, and we'll turn to Q&A. <clears throat> so I'm going to moderate this uh, session. I have a, some individual questions for the speakers, um, some of my own, some that came in from uh, people who are listening to you today. Uh, and then we'll have some general questions. Maybe you have questions for each other as well. So first, uh, to Lorne, um, you talked about repurposing drugs and you talked about uh, many different clinical trials that are going on with repurposed drugs, with new candidates. There's so many different clinical trials and the results are being reported when the numbers are still quite small. And even for remdesivir, uh, you know, we get it announced in the White House by Tony Fauci when, again, the, the trial is not complete. So how do, you, how do clinicians and patients deal with this tsunami of information and work out what is the best clinical step, uh, step forward? Question, and, and different countries are re reacting differently to these announcements. As you know, in the United States, the emergency drug use uh, approval for remdesivir has occurred. It's occurred in Japan. Uh, Gilead has given uh, generic uh, permission to generic countries to produce it around the world, and we still don't have the final results. Let me say that the first result of remdesivir in a double by or in a controlled study that was done in China, the results were disappointing and did not show significance. But I would say that uh, the the use of the drug is often late in those diseases. Patients that are in the hospital often going to ICUs and then trying to get drugs to rescue, and they're not showing that much benefit. And I think it'll be very difficult. That's for some of the immune modulator drugs, some of the ones that will intercept uh, cytokine storms. We need to see those results coming out, and maybe we get better results in late patients when we can use many of these other uh, interventions. But I think at the present time, people are, of course, they're desperate to see uh, positive results. And uh, there have been some positive results leaked. And I, I don't like the idea that they're leaked, but I think by the end of this month, we should have some of the results on a drug like remdesivir from controlled trials. And uh, that would be the major signal if this is going to be approved in many more countries and for doctors and patients to decide whether or not to use it. But uh, it is difficult in this, uh, I think two difficulties. Number one is that many of the repurposed drugs are being used very late and hard to show their benefits. We have some good studies going on where the intervention with some of these drugs will be much earlier and we'll see if there is true benefit or not, but we have to wait for those results. So one, one question from the audience, Omram Desiree, is that there have been reported side effects. So, so, you know, is this going to be a safe treatment? I think the, the issue you have to weigh here is the duration of treatment and the side effects. And I think when you're using a drug that has some side effects, and Resnivisivir will have some side effects, in particular, uh, probably hepatotoxicity, but uh, 
you may be able to use these drugs for a short enough period that you will put up with some side effects, uh, given the benefits, if they have the true benefits in treating the disease. So you have to weigh risk versus benefits of this. And I think that uh, we will see that there are, for the short course of the treatment, and as you know, some of those courses are only five days, then I think you will be looking at uh, how we balance those as clinicians. Okay, and you, you mentioned um, the, the the cytokine storms or toxic shock. That was another question that, that came up. You know, that's obviously another very important uh, factor, particularly in the late stages of the disease. And so, where are we on research to really try to modulate the immune and inflammatory responses? Well, I think that's a very important part, and I simply didn't have time to cover uh, more than I did. But cytokine storm and immune modulators are going to be extremely important. And also, I think there's a difference in patients. And some patients will, particularly the young patients, are going to have more of a cytokine storm in their rapid disease. And that's where the immune modulators might have tremendous benefit. And we just have to wait for those results. There's a number of immune modulators that are in clinical trials at the present time, some of them used with drugs, some of them used more on their own. And I think it'll be very important to see how they modify the disease in patients that have truly got an immune storm. One of the unusual things about this, of course, is the high death rate in patients in their 70s and 80s, and age is a curious factor. And cytokine storm is more likely to occur in younger people who have, uh, mount a very strong immune response compared to older people where we have a high death rate. And it's hard to imagine that that is all related to cytokine storm. Uh, I believe this is more a direct effect of the virus and the immune response in the lungs, but not necessarily the same type of cytokine storm we see in younger patients with rapid progressive disease. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to turn now to Reno, and there are quite a few questions for, for Reno on, on vaccines, because of course everybody, everybody is hoping and waiting for a, a vaccine. And I think you, you illustrated very nicely uh, that we are, in fact, on an incredibly fast time course to, to develop a vaccine, but that there are still many challenges to going from the initial development to actually getting a, a vaccine into population at, at large. So one question that came up was really specifically around the RNA vaccines, for which there has been, I would say to some degree, uh, rather a lot of hype. I mean, Moderna's results were on eight patients, which is very promising, but it's eight patients. Um, and so, you know, what are the challenges specifically for an RNA vaccine to get to the clinic? Is it really about being able to produce enough uh, doses or what, what are the other challenges along the way? Well, RNA vaccines, as I said, um, they, they have only one problem. They are very early in, and I guess without COVID, it was going to take another 10 years before they could get to the market. The reason is that <clears throat> we have data for phase one, uh, maybe phase two, uh, but <clears throat> all these data are very preliminary. <clears throat> we have plenty of data in animals. Animals, these RNA vaccines are fantastic. In humans, however, the early trials showed some side effects uh, which were unexpected, never seen in, in mice. So we, we, we had to uh, readjust the delivery system, the dosage, the way. And, and so now they've been in a few hundreds of people. And the question is, what is going to happen when you go into thousands of people? What's going to happen when you go into 100,000 people? Are you going to see side effects you have not seen so far? It's going to be okay. It's going to... So all these are unknown. There's no one RNA vaccine that's ever gone into phase three, no one phase three vaccine has been licensed. So that's one thing. The other thing is efficacy. Are we, we know in animal models that are beautiful, they work well, but humans are different. We, <clears throat> with DNA vaccines back in the early nineties, uh, we had beautiful data in mice and animals, but those data never translated in humans. So. Uh, RNA vaccines seem to be much better, but the preliminary data we have are not that many. 
Now, Moderna two days ago or three days ago announced that they have good immunogenicity and they got eight uh, patients out of eight mounted the uh, ant neutralizing antibodies. And they made a comment that those are comparable in title to the uh, neutralizing antibodies that we can see in people are convalescing from the disease. That's very exciting, very promising. Uh, however, it will be difficult to understand how good these data are until we learn more about that. Because uh, we are doing human monoclonal antibodies for the virus, and we have access to uh, a lot of sera from convalescent people. And the convalescent people can have sera uh, antibody titers, neutralizing titers that go uh, in one to 10 in terms of dilution to one to 10,000. Mm -hmm. So what we don't know is whether the uh, Moderna data are in the range of one to 10 or in the range of one, one to 100, or one to 1,000 or one to 10,000. And that will make a huge difference. So basically uh, there are still a lot of unknowns. Probably Moderna will tell us much more very quickly because the, they are proceeding very fast. But for the moment, what they said is encouraging, but only eight people. It's good that are eight out of eight. I mean, it's, uh, it's a hundred percent so far, so it's very encouraging. But the, there's still a lot of unknowns. And then, assuming that, uh, and we all hope it's gonna be like that, these vaccines will be safe or will be uh, effective. The next question is, can we manufacture enough? There is no one uh, manufacturing site worldwide that can manufacture hundreds of millions of doses of RNA vaccines. Uh, manufacturing RNA vaccine is much simpler than manufacturing uh, protein-based vaccines. So uh, the scale up can be done quickly, but we don't know uh, how long, I mean, I'm for sure it's not gonna happen in six months. So we'll need, uh, will need time to have a big manufacturing scale. So these are the uncertainties, uh, very exciting, but a lot, we need to be cautious because there are still uh, a lot of things need to happen before we know that these vaccines are safe, effective and available in large quantities. Great, thanks, thanks. that's very helpful. Um, so uh, coronaviruses, we don't have a lot of vaccines against coronaviruses. I guess there are some against animal coronaviruses, but yeah. are, there, are there specific reasons why coronaviruses might be difficult to generate a good vaccine against, or is it just that it hasn't been pushed very hard? Well, no, we've not been working on, on coronavirus vaccines because um, the, I mean, we have, uh, in humans, there are coronavirus vaccines that are, the, sorry, there are coronavirus that cause common cold, but we never tried to make vaccines against those. Uh, and there are no commercially available vaccines, and I never remember of efforts to make vaccines against those. Uh, then uh, the real dangerous ones are the uh, SARS, uh, like coronaviruses. And the first one came in 2002. We started at that time to make a vaccine. Uh, data in animals were very good. Uh, we are about to go into phase one clinical trials, but by, by that time, the uh, outbreak, which was mostly in Canada, the one which was uh, actually uh, uh, the most prominent one, basically, the outbreak finished, SARS was finished, and uh, nobody was interested anymore in developing a vaccine for uh, SARS. So as far as I know, that vaccine is, must still be on the freeze, in the freezer somewhere, and, not, and it's never gone to humans. Uh, then the next coronavirus was MERS, the one uh, that basically cause uh, respiratory tract infections and mortality in people uh, that have to deal with camels in Saudi Arabia. We had an outbreak in Korea 
Uh, but basically, uh, that was mostly restricted to uh, Saudi Arabia. There have been some push to make vaccines, and animal studies have been done. They look promising. But so far, nobody has really been investing uh, to make a vaccine for males. So, um, so the experience that we have so far to make vaccines for uh, coronaviruses are basically positive, but never been a commercially attract a vaccine commercially attractive enough to really uh, in, in basically invest uh, in making a real vaccine. And so now with uh, COVID-19. Uh, behaves like the others, actually very immunogenic. I mean, the data in animals look very good. Preliminary data in humans seems to be good as well. So it doesn't seem to be a particularly difficult vaccine to make. That's good. And going for a sort of corollary to that, um, if we go through this and generate good vaccines, will we be able to use that knowledge to rapidly develop a new vaccine for the next a coronavirus that comes, a uh, pandemic that comes down. In the same way that we do with flu, we can rapidly each year, each year modify the flu vaccine. Do you see that going to be the same for coronaviruses? Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think that should be possible. I mean, the I mean, there are also people who say, well, this virus mutating, so the vaccines we are making uh, will not be useful next year. Uh, actually, I doubt this virus is is like all the RNA viruses mutating a little bit, but the speed of mutation is pretty slow. So I do believe that the vaccines we are developing now will be okay for next year and the, probably the following year. Uh, and if new coronaviruses are going to emerge, we will be able to develop to rapidly develop vaccines. And it's amazing what's already happening now. I mean, the, you know, usually to make a vaccine, a normal vaccine, takes me 15, 20 years. That's what it took me to develop meningococcus vaccine or other vaccines. Uh, then when you have a, an emergency, you can speed up things. For Ebola, we really uh, tried to accelerate. We've been able to license a vaccine in five years. But still five years are very important, are still very long. Uh, but we learn from Ebola and the new technologies, now they allow us to speed up more. And now we are thinking to have the first vaccines in one year, which is incredible. I mean, we have been in the clinical trials with Moderna in 63 days. That's incredible. So I, I think between the technologies and what we learn from Ebola and what we are learning from this one, uh, in the future, we'll be more prepared for, uh, this, kind of, for this kind of event. Great, thanks. Uh, Chris, so modeling, um, obviously uh, there's a lot of interest in, in, in modeling the, the, uh, the rise of the epide epidemics, but there also, of course, the decline and what happens when you release the pressure on the lockdowns. So <clears throat> you, you show some data, obviously, mostly at this point, you've been looking at the effect of the lockdowns um, flattening the curve. Have you been able to see in the, yet in the jurisdictions where the lockdown has been removed, you see uh, the changes and the increase again? You see that in the Italian data? Uh, well, we're starting to see some examples of where uh, effective R, as we, we saw in some of the, uh, from uh, in the pre last presentation, is probably creeping up above one. We in within the United States, unfortunately, there's relaxation of lockdowns, particularly in a in a series of states, which uh, cases and deaths are actually still trending up. So we expect that that's going to alter the trajectory. The challenge we have in the northern hemisphere is that you have three things going on at the same time, which will drive the result. You have the social distancing mandates. Uh, they're starting to come off. You have likely some seasonality, lots of uh, debate about how big that seasonality is. Our best guess right now is that it's nothing like flu and looks much more like the general seasonality of pneumonia. Uh, 
which means we should expect, you know, uh, a slow decline in the northern hemisphere and a slow increase in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and then, of course, we have the rise of testing and the use of testing as a containment strategy through, uh, you know, test, trace, and isolate strategies. So you have this sort of balancing act. And so what's happening now in the places that relax is a little bit hard to, to disentangle from the scale up of testing and this somewhat warmer weather. Um, so I, I think all the groups that are sort of looking at the models right now think the next, in the Northern Hemisphere, the next two weeks or so will be very informative. Will we see in the places that should be increasing because of relaxation, are we going to see the, the you know, the expected numbers? Now, uh, just one comment that complicates it all is that the rise of testing itself, uh, which has been really quite a brisk in Europe and the US and South Africa, as we saw, uh, creates a false trend in the cases uh, because we're, we're detecting more of the mildly symptomatic or even asymptomatic cases. That's creating a trend up in case reporting and that can give you the false impression that R is over one. Uh, and so a lot of what we do is actually trying to focus on the trend in deaths or at least calibrate the trend in cases to adjust for the increase in testing. When you do that, we're, we haven't yet seen sort of explosive growth yet. I mean, the, the recent rise in cases in Iran is perhaps one of the more concerning increases. Uh, but again, that coincides with a big increase in testing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you mentioned uh, when you were talking about the different ways that uh, communities have spread and the focus where you get a larger spread in long-term care homes. We've seen this in, dramatically in Canada, where there really are, you know, 80% of the deaths in Canada are in long-term care and other kinds of confined uh, spaces. Uh, and then you heard from South Africa, you know, even supermarkets can become a, a community spread. So you have this general community spread, and then you have this, this almost separate pandemic in these environments. Do your modeling take account of that? Can you take account of that in any way? You know, when we started off modeling for the state of Washington, uh, where the initial epidemic here was in a elder care facility uh, and came quite early, we even at the beginning we started we modeled them as a separate population, and then we started to try to model all nursing care facilities. Uh, the, we, we stopped doing that at some point just because of the logistics of it. But given where we are now in the epidemic, where so many of the cases currently in this environment in the United States are either prisons, certain factories, or nursing facilities, nursing care facilities, uh, as we move down to the very local level, that is one of the strategies that we're thinking about. It, it makes the modeling more challenging. Uh, and you have the whole issue of seeding of those. Uh, or to put it another way, what we're learning from a place like New Zealand that has, you know, been very successful at control and transmission, very extensive testing and contact tracing, is these large transmission events, the sort of super spreader events, may be accounting for a large fraction of transmission. In New Zealand, it's about half, half of all infections were from a very small number of super spreaders at large gatherings. And that then adds, uh, you know, a dimension of the sort of chance happening of that. Uh, and that being important, it also has lots of implications for, you know, minimizing risk, particularly by restricting large gatherings. Great, thanks. And I'll turn now to the, the Karim. So, um, Obviously, you gave us a great story of what's happening in South Africa. And I guess my first question was, I think I, think I know the answer. Uh, I wrote the question before I heard your, your talk. Um, and that is, you know, South Africa, the, the infection got there later. Um, have you learned uh, from what were our mistakes that have happened in the other countries? Has, did South Africa really learn what not to do to do it better? So I'll just uh, start by uh, saying that we spent uh, quite a bit of time learning from our colleagues in China, or we spoke to colleagues in Europe about their experiences. We had uh, uh, 
video link webinars and seminars with our colleagues in, in several other countries to learn from them. But I think there's something about making your own mistakes. <laughs> we are certainly making our own mistakes as well, and we're learning from that. Uh, I, you know, I chair the, the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19, and I describe it as, you know, we are uh, sailing the ship as we are building it. Because if you ask me what's going on, if you if you talked to me two weeks ago about COVID-19 in children, I would have said, well, it seems to be a pretty mild disease. You know, there are very few hospitalizations or deaths. And then, of course, this week, WHO describes a whole new phenomenon of vasculitis, and maybe we've just been missing these, these kids. So it's, it's, it's a very rapidly growing field. And I can say that we've tried to extract what is the best evidence available. We've drawn very heavily on the World Health Organization. We've drawn heavily from other countries' experiences. And we've tried to, to do what we could to, to try and get the benefits that they have. But in addition, we do have additional strengths. And I think Croatia described them very well in that because we already deal with two large epidemics in South Africa, tuberculosis and HIV, we have an existing infrastructure to deal with epidemics. And so that becomes, you know, our past adversity is in many ways now one of our advantages. I don't know if Croatia wants to comment as well. Uh, I think, uh, Slim, you've uh, covered the issue as well. So maybe let's see if Janet has other questions. Yeah, so, so I guess um, raised the issue of uh, he had some puzzles in his day, but he was puzzled about Sub-Saharan Africa. So I, I guess I'd like to ask you if you can solve his puzzle for him. <laughs> <laughs> Janet, give me the tough question. <laughs> um, you know, um, as much as we've had incredible political leadership uh, and very timeless interventions from the very beginning, uh, from the very first, even before the first cases were reported, there was preparation going underway as we started to learn about what's going on in Wuhan, etc. And one of our big concerns was that we have large HIV and TB epidemics. And we know that the high morbidity and mortality rates that we see in the older populations are linked with comorbidities um, like um, respiratory illnesses, like cardiovascular diseases, or, and related conditions, and also some uh, different forms of immunosuppression. So our concern was with having 60% uh, almost of the global burden of HIV, not everybody on ARVs, not everyone virally suppressed, what is the um, interaction going to be? And uh, on the other hand, we also have a very young population. So if you look at the demographic um, profile, of countries in Africa because of the late introduction of ARVs, we had quite a decimation of life expectancy from uh, coming down in some countries to about 42 years. So on average, um, or if you look at the average age in our populations, they're about uh, 30, 60 or percent of the population is about 30 years old. So we have a young population but we do have comorbidities. And um, you know, we've been monitoring very carefully hospital admissions, and they've remained fairly uh, low. Um, Chris mentioned the issue of uh, community screening and asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic individuals being identified. But at the end of the day, it's a, like a beautiful dance that's going on between the number of infections that are occurring in communities, they really the source of infection and predict the uh, magnitude of the epidemic as uh, in terms of spread. And on the other hand, we're not going to stop the spread of the virus, but what we're also trying to simultaneously do is ensure that our bed capacity in our hospitals are able to manage the number of severe cases coming in. And do we, would we really need the kind of um, um, temporary uh, field facilities 
that we've seen being constructed in other parts of the world. And while we've uh, taken the initiative to do, again, upfront planning, it doesn't look uh, like right now um, we, we've not reached the peak. We're on that uh, exponential growth. We expect the numbers to go up. Whereas in other countries, we're starting to see declines in the epidemic and uh, some of the easing coming there because of those declines. Uh, but we, we have not reached the peak yet. So I ha don't have an easy, I don't have an answer to that question. It is intriguing. Is it, um, is it the, the conditions, the resilience? Is it about trained immunity from multiple uh, exposures uh, and onslaughts that we've had to the multitude of uh, epidemics we've seen um, and recently and ongoing, uh, or what um, it remains, and time I think will give us the answer. But we, we keep an open mind, we try to implement what we know works, and we're trying to do that, staying ahead of as much as possible of the virus. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, general questions to sort of end up, but I wondered if any of you have questions for each other before we turn there. I wouldn't mind asking a question of Chris Murray and the um, and our epidemiologist. Do you think that this virus will end up circulating in the population like some of the other coronaviruses that cause mild disease? Is it possible that this virus would end up being a virus that circulates long term? Boy, I don't think I have any insight into uh, that question. Um, I think I'm more confident in saying that I think we'll get a, a second wave in the fall and through the through next year. Uh, but long term circulation, um, hard, harder to know. Uh, Anyone else want to try that one, Rina? Can I ask, uh, Chris, uh, what kind of herd immunity are gonna need, we're going to need to uh, basically put uh, this virus under control so we'll not be able to circulate anymore? You mean what sort of uh, protection would a vaccine yeah. need to provide? No, no, uh, herd immunity. I mean, oh, what sort of herd immunity? Are we gonna yeah, what, what's the level? We're going to be eighty percent of the people either vaccinated or or, or the head disease, or ninety percent or sixty percent, based on what you uh, you the basically spreading of the virus. So there there is a um, essentially a myth I think that's out there that there is one value of R naught that exists for COVID-19. And that's a myth because the R0 is a function as much of social behavior as it is of the virus itself. So, so if you go back and calculate the R0 that explains what happened in New York is dramatically higher than the R0 that explains what happened in New Zealand, let's say, or the incredibly low R0 in Wyoming where despite some introduction of the virus, you know, they've had about, you know, a tiny number of cases overall. So it's a function of, you know, population density, how people live. And so therefore the answer on herd immunity is also a function of that. So the answer will be, you will have lower, you'll have herd immunity at a much lower level in places with less transmission potential, and you will need a much higher level of immunity to protect in a place like New York. Okay, so can I throw out to everyone then, <clears throat> we've talked about potential new drugs, we've focused obviously a lot on vaccines and there's a lot of hope, um, obviously in the general public about vaccines, um, but how, if we, when we get vaccines and we get drugs, how do we ensure global equitable access? Or how do we prevent nationalistic tendencies taking over? Who's going to pick that one up first? Slim? I'll start. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we are already reaching that stage where with Remdesivir, we're going to have to address this question in a very real way. And I think in the nature of what we are likely to see 
is uh, that we're going to have to have some kind of global body that can take responsibility for bringing together the different constituencies and trying to find some way in which equitable and fair distribution can, can occur. However, I will think that uh, I'm expecting that politics will trump that kind of process, especially the politics of uh, uh, leaders who believe that you know, it's their country should be first and then everyone else can follow when there's spare drug. And I think when I've uh, been uh, interacting with our colleagues from uh, Gilead that uh, make in this river, I think they are grappling with exactly this question. In a funny way, we've sort of thought about it much more for vaccines, and that's why Gavi was created. And that's why a very clear set of guidelines and rules, it, I mean, they. They're not brilliant, but they're at least some guidelines and rules about how vaccines can be made affordable and can be made available on a more equitable basis. We're now going to have to address that question for the use of Earth, and we're going to have to address it for all the new drugs and vaccines that become available. And I would hope that there would be enough confidence in the World Health Organization, because I believe that that itself as part of the United Nations should have that responsibility for driving that process so that it doesn't become any one country but becomes us as a global community finding that. Just to add perhaps is that um, at least 197 member states have signed on in terms of solidarity for vaccine development and distribution through the People's Vaccine uh, Charter. And that was signed about a week ago. So I think that uh, lessons we've learned in the past is certainly being used in terms of thinking about access and equitable uh, distribution. And over and above that, I think it's important, and, and here again, WHO has taken the lead, is that we, we have so few products, whether they therapeutics or, I mean, um, or, or vaccines, that are promising enough to go into clinical trials. And it's really important that when we do these clinical trials, that we don't do them as small, isolated trials in defined populations, but that they are tested across the globe because that everybody needs to benefit from this. So the kinds of things that um, others have mentioned about side effects, you don't want to discover that when you now have initiate a ten, the 10,000 person. And you want to do this uh, properly right at the outset while you're evaluating effectiveness of a product uh, and, and taking those downstream issues or upstream issues in terms of equity into account. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I think, I, yeah. And I think in the case of vaccines, I think uh, the I mean, there is a, an organization, the CEPI, uh, which is located in London and in Norway, that basically they are trying to coordinate the uh, vaccine development globally. Uh, and they are teaming up with WHO and uh, with Gavi, so the three uh, global organizations that should make a team and try to coordinate globally. Um, there is nationalism going on, so we have to face that. The, from the industry point of view, I think what we can do is basically to make sure that there are enough vaccines available so that they will, in a short period of time, we can basically reach every angle of the world. That's, for instance, the attitude that we took in GSK. We, are, we have an argument which we believe is going to be essential to make vaccines based on proteins. And we decided to make it available to all companies worldwide uh, that are willing to make vaccines in large numbers. So we made agreements with Chinese companies, Australian companies, companies in Europe, North America, and so on. So basically, uh, we hope that all these companies will make enough vaccines that will be available to, for everybody. Because if you have only a few million doses, then it's going to be nations are going to fight to get those millions. And unfortunately, the ones going to be able to pay more will be the ones that will be, be able to get those. So we need to have 
uh, more vaccine than what is needed, so there will be uh, doses available for everybody. Chris, do you have a comment? Um, I think this is a tricky, very challenging question. I mean, I, th I would agree with what's being said about what should happen, which is, you know, a coordinated global effort. What will happen is a different question, and I, I'm less convinced that there will be a coordinated uh, global effort, unfortunately. It's the beginning, there is a fight that, that I think Reno's point is that whatever we're looking at it should be made in large enough quantities that in the end it will be available. Um, so it's good. I'll, just, I'll just end with a sort of question, a more general one. So here we are, we're, we're all in different countries and we're all in lockdowns of various sorts. Uh, and at some point they're lifting the lockdown. Um, but what's the world going to look like when we actually come out at the end of this? Will we learn things? Will, obviously things will change. Um, but particularly, I think the COVID uh, crisis has really accentuated and shown us in stark terms how the vulnerable and disadvantaged populations around the world, and even, you know, in, a and even you know, in our own countries, uh, get are really suffering from this disease, from the health aspects and from the economic aspects. So will we come out with long-term solutions to some of those, or are we just going to go back to what we were doing before? Yeah, I think there's going to be some pretty uh, uh, beneficial thing, you know, if you can think of any benefits coming out of such a terrible uh, pandemic. I mean, one thing that's emerged is just the extraordinary value of daily data. If you think about it, it's really quite incredible that the world is now attention turns to data from yesterday. You know, how many cases, how many deaths, how many hospitalizations, as opposed to data from two or three years ago, which, you know, when there's a DHS survey in global health and it gets analyzed and the results are from about three years ago, uh, you know, we've, we've turned a totally different framing about the value importance of data. And I'm hoping that that will actually continue as, as in, into the future and put everybody on a, on a sort of more sound footing. Uh, the other one that I think is going to make a big difference to the research community is we have demonstrated, not so much, I guess, for the lab sciences, but for others, that uh, remote or digital work is highly effective and there's really no longer any reason to think that you need to have everybody sitting in London or in Oxford or in some university. I think it'll it'll makes it much more likely that we're going to see effective research, you know, collaborations uh, on a much more equitable basis around the world because the technology has made it really quite feasible at least for those who have access to the internet uh, to be highly effective in distributed settings. And I think that's a lesson that people didn't really believe, and, and now it's so clear uh, that it'll probably have a lasting effect, at least on the academic community. I think the academic community will stop doing so much travel. We will not be going to conferences. We will be having our conferences like this one online. Uh, Rina, comment on what you think the post-COVID world is going to look like? Well, the uh, I think the, I will focus on the technology part and vaccine development. Um, and the, I, I think it's never happened before that in a few months we'll learn so much about this virus. Still, is a, we don't know very much about it, but I mean, we accumulate in three months basically knowledge that for HIV it took 10 years. And, uh, and it's, it's remarkable. Now, we have been able to accelerate vaccine development, drug development in an incredible way, going to clinical trials. They're done in 60 days, things that usually take years. Uh, and that's because there is a global collaboration. So it's uh, uh, the regulatory agencies, uh, the manufacturers, uh, the, uh, the, sci the scientists, uh, basically they all are one team and they collaborate, they talk every day, and things move. Uh, and the question is, are we going to learn these things going to be fast in the future? 
Uh, I remember when we had the H1N1 pandemic in 2009, uh, we're not going at this speed, but things were going fast. And we said, well, now we learn that we can go fast. But as soon as the pandemic went away, we forgot everything, went back to the way of doing things before. Uh, now, I think this one is quite different. Uh, it's now one year and then goes away. And the economic impact is huge. I mean, uh, I mean there are uh, trillions and trillions of uh, the economic impact. So uh, I think there is uh, probably good reason to believe that this time the impact will be remembered, that we will uh, remember that we, uh, I mean, the emerging infections are so important and we need to be prepared. And uh, we basically we need to invest in these things even in time when these things will be gone away. Um, so I hope that's going to happen. It didn't happen in the past. Good. Any last comments? If not, I have one. The one last question that just came in over the over the uh, internet, um, and we have five minutes. So I just want a very quick answer from each of you. So the general question is: What is bringing you hope in these uncertain times? So I'll go in turn. John, what brings you hope? I think the hope is coming from the tremendous collaboration between scientists. When I see the um, paper that I mentioned, Kim, you know, Nature, looking at the interactome of the 29 proteins or 26 of the proteins of the virus interacting with the host cell in 332 ways, identifying 62 new targets. This is all happening so very quickly that I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to see the development of antivirals that will be highly effective and uh, maybe in combinations like we've seen with HIV, a single drug that would treat COVID uh, early in the disease and uh, see this uh, change the course of the whole disease. Okay, so uh, Croatia and Slim, what gives you hope? The, uh, the global solidarity and collaboration uh, in terms of scientific advances is, you know, simply breathtaking. But I also feel that as individuals and communities, the way we've responded to the epidemic, quite often taking the, the interventions that we are adopting is not so much about protecting ourselves, but also about protecting others. And this sort of caring for each other to me is very optimistic, despite all the realities of the, uh, disparities that have been long standing and shown up again. So I think that comprehensive response of balancing public health with uh, social protection and looking at uh, and not uh, compromising um, livelihoods while we try and respond. Thanks. Thank you. I'm, go I'm going to pass on this. Let me have to go that one. <laughs> Rina, what would you have? Well, the, I, I think uh, all these difficult moments are always opportunities. And the opportunity here has been several fronts. One is science and the way we work. Uh, as I said before, I mean, during the last two or three years, I was organizing meetings uh, with the entitled Transforming Vaccinology. I wanted to get vaccines faster, uh, done differently, more collaboration, more things, uh, using the latest science. And I was organizing meetings. People were saying yes, but it was going to take forever to get there. And now this virus really transformed vaccinology. I mean, it's really, I mean, it has done it has already, I mean, in three months. So that's already push. So I think uh, this is going to improve the, thing, the way we're going to do things in the future. The other thing, which has been mentioned a little bit, I think this virus has shown us that we can do things differently. We can collaborate more remotely. We can work. Uh, a lot of people can do social working. They're actually very effective. They don't need to be every day in the office. We, uh, uh, and we can learn from that. I think that will change. But probably the most important thing from my point of view, uh, I mean, we are all worried about our planet. The fact that basically we are using more resources. 
and we are polluting this planet and may not be sustainable. I think what we've seen is that I mean, it's been enough to have a little bit of social distancing to get the planet uh, resilient again. And so basically the pollution has gone down, the uh, water in Venice is clean. The, I mean, it's amazing. And the, the animals are walking in the empty cities. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So I think uh, the hope is that we'll learn that the planet can go back and we can have a healthy planet for, for us and for the future generations. You just need to basically give up a little bit of the crazy life we used to have before COVID. Hey, Chris, you got the last word and we're down to one o'clock, so short. <laughs> Uh, well, I think the amazing thing to me is we went through a long period where sort of science was being downplayed in the political sphere. There was a really strong culture of almost anti-science. And now we have an environment where politicians of all stripes are asking for constant input from the scientific community, looking to the scientific community to bring new drugs, new vaccines, new solutions. So I think that the, the sort of prominence of science now in public discourse and at the center of you know, every day's news is, gives me some optimism for the future. Great, thank you. And that's really about where I was going to go too. And the Gerdner Foundation, of course, part of our mission is to sort of raise awareness of science and the importance of science, celebrating scientific excellence, which is demonstrated by the people we've had on the panel today. So thank all of you very much indeed. I hope the audience has enjoyed the session. It has been recorded, so it will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, and please check our website, uh, check our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram accounts, uh, for information on future events. So stay well, stay safe, goodbye.